Hello everyone and welcome to this new Godot tutorial. Today we're gonna see how to set up a simple data load system based on Godot's built-in resource tools. Our goal here will be to improve on the basic tower defense to the game we made in this previous Godot c -sharp tutorial and use some external data files to define the various properties of our towers and ships. So by the end of the video, we will have more enemy and tower types and basically have transformed our game from this basic version to this new advanced one. By the way, don't forget that if you want to check out the assets of the first tutorial, you can head over to the GitHub repo with all my Godot tutorials over here. For this episode, I've made sure to separate the base version from the last tutorial from the one we make in this video by giving my scripts specific c -sharp namespaces and extracting some common files to a shared folder on the side. I've also made sure to prepare the scenes and assets for this tutorial so that they point to these new script versions, so you should be all good to go if you just download the repo and dive into this new folder. Anyway, with this in mind, let's get to it and see how to create and load our own data. In Godot, most of the assets in your project are stored as resource files with the .trs extension. These base objects are basically text files in a TOML-like format that contain various properties or logic depending on the type of resource and that can be edited directly in the editor with the inspector panel. The nice thing is that we can actually create our own resource types to easily set up, edit and use our own data structures. So let's go to our project and create a new c -sharp script to define the properties of our ships, called shipdata.cs. We'll have this class inherit from the resource c -sharp class instead of the default node class, and then inside we'll create some exposed public variables for our ships. The speed, the health points, the reward, and the sprite. Because we want this class to act as a resource, we actually have to transform our base variables into fields with a getter and a setter, like this. And then all we have to do is create a default parameterless constructor so that Godot can properly initialize the resource when we create an instance of this ship data class. The next step is to actually set up our project so that we can quickly create ship data instances and therefore create various configurations for enemy ships. Now, if we were working with GDScript, we could easily transform this class into a new custom resource type by just giving it the class name property at the top. Just by adding this info, we'd then be able to browse through a list of resource types and create a new instance of our own class. But because we're working with C-Sharp, Godot doesn't yet offer as much tooling for this, and we'll have to do a bit of extra work to make this ship data a real custom resource. Luckily, an easy workaround is to use this nice Godot plugin by Atlinx, the Godot Mono Custom Resource Registry plugin. Basically, this will allow us to easily register any c -sharp class derived from the resource type in Godot's list of resources, so that we can create it easily from the new resource menu. So we'll go to GitHub, then head over to the list of releases and download the latest one. Then we'll unzip the downloaded archive and copy it in the Godot project inside the new add-ons folder at the root of the project files. Now that we've added the files, we'll go back to the Godot editor and down to the MS Build panel to rebuild the c -sharp solution. And finally, in the project settings panel, we'll open the plugins tab and enable the tool. This will show a new button in the top right corner of the editor, marked CCR, that will allow us to easily update the custom resource registry of our project and thus re-update the list of available resource types. Then to actually apply this tool to our custom ship data resource, we'll just need to give our class the registered type attribute. This attribute requires the name of the resource, optionally the path to an icon for the list display, and the name of the parent type to stack this new item under in the list. Let's now rebuild our solution and click on the CCR button in the top right corner. And now if we try to create a new resource in our project, we see that we have all new ship data available and that we can easily double click it to create a new .trs file from it and then re-double click this asset to edit its properties in the Godot inspector. 
We get back our four fields from before, so the speed, the HP, the reward and the sprite. And the default values are the ones that we define in our default parameterless constructor. Of course, we can easily create other instances of the ship data class that override these defaults to create our other types of ships. So we've managed to set up a couple of ship types with their own values for each parameter. It's now time to actually use this data in our game and replace our hard-coded values with this data by loading the info at runtime. In our first tutorial, we've taken the easy road and written by hand all of our ship and tower properties in the c -sharp scripts, to really focus on the logic itself. Typically, our ship manager has some hard-coded values for the speed, the HP and the reward, and its sprite is currently defined directly in the scene. Just as a quick reminder, this is an exact copy of the ship manager script we ended up with last time, so at the end of the last tutorial. I've just changed its namespace to avoid any conflicts with the base version, as we progress through this video. Now, to make it easy to configure a ship based on an instance of our new ship data class, we're going to create a new function in our ship manager class, called initialize, that receives a ship data parameter and extracts back the values from it in its own fields. For the ship's image, we'll directly get back our sprite node and assign its texture field based on the sprite property of our ship data resource. Then we'll go back to our level manager script and in the onEnemySpawn callback function, instead of simply instantiating a ship and leaving it as is, we'll want to call its initialize method with some ship data instance. To get this data, we'll do a random pick inside an array of ship data that is exposed in the inspector and that we can easily fill with our resource files from before. And that's about it! If we rerun our game now, we see that our ship spawner regularly produces ship instances with random types chosen among the three available. These ships indeed have different sprites, they move at different speeds, and if they reach the end of the path, or they are killed, they reduce our life's counter by a different amount and they give different rewards. But of course now we want to have a way of fighting these upgraded ships, so we're going to do something similar for towers, and add new types. For these new ships, our basic towers are hardly a challenge, so in this section we're going to reapply our data class definition process to create several types of towers, then have our UI automatically display the right buttons in the interface to pick and build our different tower types, and ensure our placing mechanic properly propagates the particular characteristics of our chosen tower to the actual placed instance. So to begin with, let's make another data class called Tower Data that also inherits from the resource class and that has the registered type attribute. In here, we'll have six properties. The attack rate, the attack damage, the attack speed, the field of vision radius, the cost and the specific sprite. Like before, we'll make a parameterless default constructor to help Gado initialize instances of this new resource type and then we'll rebuild our solution and press the CCR button so that we can create our tower resource files. For these tutorials, I'll just make two. One of the default values that matches the base tower from our previous tutorial, and another tower type that's more powerful so that we stand a chance against these new upgraded chips. The next step is to make our UI auto-display build buttons for each of these tower types. To do this easily, I've made sure to transform my tower build button into its own subscene, so that I can instantiate it quickly. And I'm now going to reopen the level manager script and create an exposed array of tower data objects. I'll create a new exposed pack scene variable too for my new button tower scene. Now in the ready function, we need to replace the loop we had previously on the UI build buttons so that instead we iterate over our tower types and actually create UI elements for each. This all boils down to the following code, where we first instantiate our new button tower asset variable, then set the icon of the tower and the cost label based on our data, and finally we connect the signals of the newly created button as we did before. 
As usual, remember to rebuild the solution and then drag the references in the inspector on the level node so that all this data is well initialized. Now, the thing is that because now each tower button corresponds to a different configuration, we need to actually pass on this info to our logic when we click on the button, so that each element prepares a different type of tower. So I'm going to extend our connection to the pressed signal with the data like this. As you can see, Godot actually requires us to pack any additional input parameters when we connect a signal like this into a godot.collections.array object, because in theory we could have multiple parameters to inject. But anyway, this means that in our callback method definition, we need to add this new input in the prototype. And we can now use this data to properly set our place in context. Basically, we'll want to do three things. First, when we check we have enough coins to buy the tower, we'll pass the exact cost of the tower we want to build. Then, if we do engage placing mode, we'll need to set up our tower to place instance so it matches the properties of the tower type we want to place. And finally, we'll want to store this data in a new tower to place data variable inside our level manager class so that we can reaccess it if we actually build the tower at one point in the future. Of course, the two first changes imply some modifications in our other scripts as well. Typically, in the game manager, our method can buy tower now receives a cost input and checks the current amount of coins against this value. And in the tower to place manager, we'll need to define a new function called setTowerData that uses the given data instance to update the sprite of the tower according to the texture stored in the resource file and then set the radius of the object. I'll actually extract my logic to set the radius in a function so that I can call it both at the start and when I reassign a new tower data instance. Last but not least, we need to make sure that all this tower specific data is transferred to a new tower object when we click to actually build it. We'll do this back in our level manager script by first passing the exact cost of the tower to our buy tower function in the click logic and then going down to a place tower function and passing in the entire tower data instance to our initialize function, instead of just the tower to place dot radius. Then we'll update our games manager by tower function, so it takes in the cost value to check for, and remove our constant tower cost that is now useless. And to wrap all this up, in our tower manager class, we'll change the initialize method so it expects a tower data input and extracts back the various properties for the tower from it. And with all this done, our tower defense game now implements new enemy types and new tower types. We can click on the buttons in our UI at the bottom to select the type of tower we want to place and consume the matching amount of coins when we actually build them and then watch them attack the enemy ships with different speeds and damage amounts. And because we've used Godot's system of resource files, it is super easy for anyone in the team to update the stats of the enemies and the towers so even non-developers and the game mechanic pros can rework the overall balancing of the game in a flash to quickly iterate and improve the gameplay loop. Anyway, with that said, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this quick tutorial and that you learned a few things to creating and loading custom data in Godot. If you did, feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel. And of course, if you have other ideas of Godot tricks that you'd like to learn, or if you want me to continue on this series about the tower defense to the game, don't hesitate to leave a comment. As always, thanks a lot for watching, and take care.